time at the end uh, for some questions and, and commentary. So for those who do not use uh, colonoscopy navigation or haven't had a chance to uh, experience it over, the, over their career or training, uh, there is some literature out there. There's not a lot. Uh, there's a couple of meta-analyses looking at a variety of small studies, um, but there does seem to be some benefit from this. Uh, and in terms of meaningful outcomes, uh, clearly sequel intubation rate is something we care about. Uh, and at least in one meta-analysis, that uh, improvement seems to be as high as, as 4%. And while we often think that uh, more tools and, and more technology in the room may actually slow us down, there is some suggestion that it actually may help speed us up, uh, particularly for uh, more advanced endoscopists, so, which is uh, a really important concept uh, when you're thinking about how you can kind of continue to improve and continue to be more efficient, uh, particularly when you're in the middle and later parts of your career. And there is some suggestion that it both decreases the need for sedation and may improve patient comfort scores as well, which of course are also uh, very important uh, outcomes from a, a patient management standpoint. And this is just uh, one of um, the charts displaying that from one of the meta-analyses posted a few years ago showing magnetic, magnetic uh, endoscopy imaging uh, being beneficial for uh, improving sequel intubation rate. Of course, the other reason to think about this is improvement in quality uh, during performance. Uh, and, you know, we think about this both in the training aspect uh, when we're um, in our fourth and fifth year and, and any advanced training. Uh, and then for those of us who are doing active training uh, for uh, trainees and residents, uh, this becomes a, a very important concept. But of course, once we get into practice, as we know, that's where a lot of our learning takes place and continues to take place throughout our career. Uh, and so we're always kind of thinking about how we can improve our skills, how we can improve patient outcomes. And, and just to kind of put a, a quick little plug in here, which was mentioned in the intro, uh, using navigation with colonoscopy is integral to skills enhancement in endoscopy. Uh, and in particular, the uh, programs listed here uh, that are put on by the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. Uh, and in that same vein, uh, we're all kind of, you know, looking to kind of move through this uh, area of learning here. And, you know, once you're kind of out in practice, we like to think that most people have uh, mastered uh, endoscopy on some level um, and you know, kind of become what we call unconsciously competent. But of course, we're always trying to think about moving backwards to consciously competent uh, because sometimes we get somewhere and we're able to do something and we do it every day. Uh, but when someone asks us to actually explain what we're doing and why we're doing it, it, it's not necessarily all that easy. That becomes relevant both in terms of your own skill set, but it also becomes very relevant if you're trying to teach somebody else how to do a skill. Uh, it's good to be able to put in words what your brain is thinking. And of course, the ability to, to um, visualize this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when you're doing cases uh, helps to ingrain those uh, neural pathways uh, and help you achieve uh, going backwards, if you will, to conscious competence. So that brings us to uh, one of Fujifilm's newer offerings, which is their navigation device known as Colo Assist Pro. And I figured uh, before kind of getting into uh, looking at kind of the aspects of the technology itself, uh, maybe we kind of look at a, a quick video of what it looks like in action. And so this is a uh, um, colonoscopy from you know, a few weeks ago here. And again, I won't belabor all of uh, the details on this. Uh, sorry about that. But um, as you can see in the bottom right corner, you will see the scope image. And if I kind of just skip along here a little bit later, you can see as you're coming through the sigmoid colon, you're kind of seeing what we often see, which is that need for clockwise torque and the initial formation of a loop. And uh, as we know, uh, we, we can feel that and we think about that. And the ability to visualize exactly what's happening may not help you uh, for a large majority of cases, but it, it's allowing you to kind of think about what you're doing. And when you kind of get into problems that are a little bit less clear, uh, it, it definitely becomes beneficial in terms of changing your algorithms in terms of how you're going to approach problems. And this is a relatively standard sigmoid colon where a, a small loop formed, but with 
reduction of the loop and um, and withdrawal, you can see it kind of straightens out as you make it into the uh, splenic flexure area. Uh, what I would point out here is uh, I, I don't think this is particularly distracting. It's off, off to the side. Um, and you're able to kind of see when you get to, you know, some of your natural checkpoints uh, in the scope and allows you to help kind of think about what your next move is going to be. And we can come back to this video later uh, if we have time. So in terms of the design, uh, it's uh, relatively standard in terms of what's necessary here. So obviously you have a processor to help um, bring in the, the data that the magnet is collecting. Uh, a nice little feature of the Colo Assist Pro is the hand marker. Uh, so you'll see it right there. Now, for those of us who kind of think a lot about kind of what we're doing during colonoscopy and what techniques we're using to, to help advance, particularly in troublesome cases, uh, oftentimes we're not necessarily thinking about abdominal pressure, but there are certainly a few uh, situations where it can be very beneficial. And uh, I personally believe that it, it's very good to be able to talk to your assistants in the room, the nurses in the room, um, of what you're doing uh, for certain techniques and why. And when I display this tool later, you'll kind of see how it's a, uh, quite helpful to, to use this as an adjunct in, in certain situations. And uh, for times where you are using it and you want to clean it, it is uh, compatible with standard disinfection. There's a transceiver dish. Uh, relatively small, mobile, and uh, easy to kind of adjust to get to um, get to the front of the patient next to the uh, the bed. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be particularly detailed in its positioning. Uh, it has a very uh, good signal pickup, so it's good to about 50 centimeters away from the patient and you're still going to get a relatively accurate tracing. The interface itself is is quite easy to operate. Uh, the views are as you would expect them to be, and there is um, some different uh, colors uh, on the image itself uh, that allows you to kind of get a sense as to where the difference is in terms of the tip of the scope versus uh, where you're uh, handling it that outside of the patient. And it does have this unique sky view mode, which you'll see down in the bottom right corner, which is designed to kind of simulate the physician view from a bit further above the patient. These are the, the uh, specifications of the endoscope. So it's a uh, um, special scope that uh, is compatible from the uh, Alexio series. Uh, the tube itself, 12.8 millimeters with a uh, 3.8 millimeter working channel. In the room, what you'll have is you'll have the transceiver dish on a stand, uh, the compatible colonoscope, the hand marker in the instance that you need it, and the rest of it will all be stacked in your tower. You can have a second monitor if you want, but uh, as I displayed on that earlier image, uh, it fits quite nicely onto the side of a standard monitor, assuming you have a reasonably sized monitor. Uh, you do have the option to run it in a single screen or dual screen mode. Um, my experience with it, I've tended to use it in a single screen mode, uh, which uh, can then be focused based on patient position. And what you'll end up seeing uh, on the monitor, not to go through each of these points, but you'll see here. So there's the scope. Uh, I think the things that are important. So number one, that's the patient position that you'll see. So currently that patient is in the supine position. And if you look down here, this is essentially what it looks like based on what position you have the patient in. Uh, this is linked to a single button on the scope. So it's easy to toggle through these positions uh, if you were to reposition the patient. Um, so there's nothing you need to do on the tower itself. Uh, just this uh, push of a button allows you to rotate through each of those images. Oh, and uh, the white marker, which I'll show you again later, uh, is what will come up if you were to use the uh, hand marking device, uh, which is nice because it allows allows your assistant to to direct abdominal pressure where you want the pressure in those um, few instances where you deem it to be helpful. Uh, another nice feature is that it, uh, you can turn on auto centering. So even if um, the image is being picked up a bit lateral from where you're at, uh, the computer will uh, naturally center it into the middle of your screen, uh, which is kind of one less distraction when you're when you're doing this. So 
at our center, we were somewhere probably around 150 cases now with the Colo Assist Pro. More recently, we've had the opportunity to use uh, the CAD eye system as well, which uh, Dr. Moscow will uh, go into more detail on a bit later. So I figured I'd just go through a couple of other cases, not, not to show anything particularly uh, challenging, I don't think, from uh, a procedural standpoint, but more so just to look at fairly common issues we get into when we're doing cases uh, and, and what that endoscopy image uh, actually translates to in terms of thinking about how you're going to um, tackle that case. So in this particular instance, uh, you can see coming through a sigmoid colon with diverticulosis, uh, there is a uh, loop forming in the uh, bottom right corner, which you can see on the colo assist image. Uh, this loop itself in this patient was fairly well tolerated as it was advancing and it was advancing fairly easily. Um, and much like that earlier case I showed, um, once you get so far along, you are able to kind of make a decision as to when you want to try to reduce that loop. And it's one of those things we kind of probably just do naturally without thinking about it too, too much. Uh, but the benefit of having the image is, you know, you do get a good sense as to when the tip of the scope is above the apex of the loop, uh, which is generally necessary to adequately reduce. Uh, I make a polyp disappear there um, through simple editing. <laughs> but um, as, as it's uh, approaching up to the splenic flexure, as you can see, there's not quite a full alpha loop, but pretty close uh, to it there. But before advancing further with the scope, it, it, it allows you to kind of hit that checkpoint of, all right, do I want to keep pushing or do I want to do something to, to help give myself a more simple scope to work with, both for completing the procedure and in the instance that therapeutics are going to be necessary, obviously you want as straight of a scope as possible. And, and that's, that's what this uh, particular video highlights. Now, contrast that with uh, this next one, whereby I get into a, a fairly common issue when doing colonoscopy, which is this deep um, U loop in the transverse colon. And as you can see, as I try to advance, there's a little bit of bowing at the splenic flexure, but the scope is still advancing. This patient was quite comfortable. And um, I, I thought this video would be kind of a helpful one just for looking at, you know, when we get these images, some people find these distracting and, and find that it kind of changes what you would normally do. And this is just one of those instances where you can see you're putting additional scope in and, and you can see why. And you know that it's generally a safe thing to be doing, the patient's comfortable, and then just getting tipped around to the hepatic flexure, as you can see here with um, the scope, it, it's now straight and, and we're looking down towards the cecum. Now, uh, they're not all that simple. And uh, this is a case whereby there was kind of a mixture of loops coming in. And as you can see, there's some pseudomelanosis in this particular colon. Uh, so, you know, you start to wonder, is the colon gonna be a bit longer, a bit more redundant and a bit more challenging? Uh, certainly you can see the effect that had on the preparation. Uh, I may, you may not have been watching there, but uh, there was a bit of a, I'll just go back. There was a bit of a loop in the, in the sigmoid as I was starting to come across the transverse. Uh, this was a good checkpoint to, to kind of say, you know what, um, this is going to be better dealt with now, uh, knowing that the rest of the colon may not be straightforward. And um, certainly as, you know, I'm starting to make my way across the transverse colon, there are prep issues, but um, certainly the anatomy is not necessarily uh, the easiest either. Um, I have the image there looking at a left lateral, although this patient was actually in the supine position at this point, and I just hadn't switched the image over as of yet. And as you can see, as the transverse colon gets approached, the, the colo assist image is actually very nice for kind of demonstrating what's happening here, which is getting a bit of a U-loop in the transverse colon. There's some bowing up at the splenic flexure. I had the patient take a deep breath. I tried the stiffener and I, and you know, I was able to advance a bit beyond the um, pro, uh, distal transverse, but was still having a little bit of issue here. And so this was one of those instances where I thought uh, abdominal pressure perhaps would be beneficial to keep this from bowing down here deeper into the abdomen. And so if you just bear with me for a second here, what you'll see is the hand device, um, gets grabbed by the nurse in a second. There we go. 
And just at that area where we could see it going down a moment ago, uh, I start to advance and I'm now getting a bit more traction in terms of going forward. That hand is still in the same position, uh, a little bit of um, resistance to kind of tipping around the hepatic flexure here, but certainly I was able to bypass that mid transverse colon, which was the initial uh, problem that I was getting into there. And this is always interesting uh, in the room when you have an assistant looking at it and they're putting pressure in and they can see why. And then when it does work, it, it kind of reinforces kind of that thought process of, of what you're doing and why. And the additional challenge in this case is, as you can see, the cecum lies quite medial, as you can see the tip of the scope heading in towards the midline there. So, you know, in summary, it's one of those things that um, there's a variety of reasons to consider using navigation. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to use it, uh, it's one of those uh, technologies that, you know, maybe it takes a little bit of time to get used to that extra set of images to, that you're looking at while you're doing a colonoscopy, uh, but it's generally not particularly distracting. Uh, there is some literature to, to suggest that it is a helpful tool, and certainly anecdotally, I find it to be quite helpful uh, in the room. And, you know, some arguments are that, you know, we don't need it. And my thought has always been, you know, you don't need it until you need it. And, and it's that case where, you know, you've used it for nine straightforward colons and then you get into that challenging colon and uh, helping to troubleshoot and, and run a particular algorithm of, of how you're going to advance the scope becomes quite, quite uh, helpful. Uh, it's, this particular device has been easy to integrate into our endoscopy unit. Uh, it's accurate, it's responsive. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the on-handle controls are quite convenient. And in those cases where you need some abdominal pressure, the hand device can be uh, quite helpful. So I'll stop there. Um, Mark, uh, I don't know if we were gonna take questions now or if we we're gonna try to package the two of these together or maybe a little bit of both, but I'll, I'll hand off to you. So thank you, Dr. Burgess. Yeah, so we were going to take a few questions now, if there if there's any. I don't see any right now in the chat, uh, but I toggled a couple of things in my brain through your through your presentation. So um, my first is to say, like, um, do you think colocyst will help with non sedation colonoscopy? Like, have you found that doing this helps keep people off of medication, like less sedation for the procedures? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think um, as far as patient goes for doing uh, colonoscopies unsedated, uh, it, it is a certain patient that goes for it. But of course, the most particular aspect of, of that is, is it being offered to patients, right? Oftentimes, they've never been offered to do a colonoscopy awake. Uh, but this is one of those uh, technologies that I think really does help with that. And the reason for that is I think you pay a bit more attention to technique. I think you're probably a bit less likely to put in really complex loops um, and uh, being able to reposition the patient and, and kind of deal with problems before they arise uh, tends to make that a much more um, successful endeavor when you when you do uh, proceed with a unsedated colonoscopy. Okay. And then does that sort of sort of the same? I hope you didn't hear that beep. I've got text to me through. Uh, sort of a little off topic, but maybe similar. So what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, water submersion versus CO2 versus air for colonoscopy? I mean, I, I saw you flushing some water and then that prep wasn't fantastic. So I do some suction, putting water back in again. Um, have you noticed any difference using water or CO2? Well, specifically water. Have you noticed any difference with water uh, usage for colo-assist? Have you found it different, more challenging? Does it work the same? Any issues? The big difference I noticed, and again, this is completely anecdotal, uh, which is doing more water immersion, which kind of has been my approach for the last couple of years at least. Uh, when you do have the navigation, I, I find that you don't get the standard alpha loops or end loops in the sigmoid colon as often. Um, I think uh, having a decompressed bowel, you're you're much less likely to have those tight angulations, and I find that more commonly you get to the splenic flexure with a very straight scope, um, without necessarily having done any advanced loop reduction or anything like that. And, and I think that is kind of part and parcel with using water to visualize the lumen as opposed to distending it with air or CO2, whatever you, whatever you're using. 
I said I did see Jeff raise his hand. Before I get to Jeff, though, I did have a question from our, our participants about uh, a difference. So, do you see or have you experienced a big difference uh, with this uh, technique in this program versus the Olympus system? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, um, what I will say is, uh, since I've been in practice, we have not um, I, I've not had Olympus at our at our center at any point. Uh, so I, I've used the device mostly in the setting of my initial training and and with the C courses uh, themselves. Um, and so the big difference I, I noticed, and again, uh, some of it may be my ignorance as to what what uh, new upgrades there's been to the Olympus system. But uh, the two the two differences I notice um, would be the the hand marker device and and the toggling on the scope and again that may be different for the olympus uh, tool now i don't know uh, and so for us this is kind of the first time in a few years we've had um an imager in place and so the the big difference i notice is actually just having it to be honest so uh, it'd be difficult for me to kind of compare them head to head because I, I don't think i had that day-to-day -day experience with uh with scope guide Okay, and one more one more question before I get to Jeff. Sorry, I see you when I ask that question. Um, uh, and you may not be able to answer this. Um, added cost. Do, do you know uh -huh. what the cost is to the endoscopy unit for a unit? I, I believe you would need to have, you know, if you have if you're running three rooms, obviously you need to have three receptors or receivers for each room, correct? Yeah, so our move has been to um, run it in two of our rooms. So we um we go through, as you know, a, a provincial system in terms of uh, purchasing. So actually, I don't know what the quoted price of, of this add-on is. Um, there may be somebody from uh, Vantage on the call who can answer that question, uh, although I suspect there may be um, some province-to-province -province variation as well. But I don't have a number for you. Okay. okay. Uh, Jeff, I have another question, but I'll go to you first, Jeff, if you have a question. It yeah, my my question was was actually going to be to compare it to the Olympus and the Pentax systems, um, but you sort of answered that, Rob. Like I have some experience uh, using both of the other ones. Uh, we have an Olympus uh, imager in our unit. I had the Colossus Pro um, as well with our Fuji system, and I've used Pentax just with the C courses, and I, I find uh, I find it very similar. I find it actually a little bit easier to use. Uh, than the uh, Olympus one, um, and I really like the color coding uh, that's on it. I found that it, it, it may be a small thing, but I, I actually thought that was a difference maker in terms of the way it showed up and and uh, just getting to know where the pressure points were and you know how much uh, um, I guess pressure and torque you were putting on the scope. So I really like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I was just going to ask you to compare them too. Yeah, and and I th I think that is a good comment. I would agree with that uh, in terms of uh, the the setup. Uh, the the transceiver is it's not cumbersome at all. So you know when you start a case, even if it's not already, you just grab it and kind of put it over by the abdomen somewhere, and uh, and I haven't had any issues with that. Um, and so that that feature has actually been quite nice in terms of not having to right. fiddle with the exact position. Yeah, yeah, it's seamless. You know, our, when I used to ask the nurses to use the uh, scope guide, they used to groan. Uh, and if I know one thing, it's asking the nurses to do any extra work is a big no-no. Uh, and so, but they didn't flinch with the colo assist. It was just part of the workflow, it seemed, right away. Um, and so I... Uh, you know, for whatever reason, it was just more seamless and, and fit into the system quite easy. And we hope, Jeff, none of your nurses are attending the meeting tonight, so. <laughs> oh, they, they are tired of hearing me talk, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have one more comment from a, from a uh, participant, and then we'll move on to Dr. Moscow. So the one comment was, you know, magnetic, uh, magnetic endoscopy imaging will definitely shorten the training's learning curve. They will get a 3D sense of what is happening visualizing resolving loops. So I, I think that's a, 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 a plus and a proponent of moving this, this sort of technology moving forward for all of our trainees, hopefully. Um, so Dr. Berger, if you're finished, I'd like to move on to Dr. Mosco, if that's okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Dr. Mosco is a clinical, uh, sorry, clinician in quality and improvement, CQI in the Division of Gastroenterology at St. Michael's Hospital and Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. 
He serves as the GI Division Director for Postgrad Education at St. Mike's Hospital. He serves as co-director of Advanced, sorry, Advanced Endoscopy Fellowship at St. Michael's Hospital, and he's the international course, sorry, and the international course on therapeutic endoscopy. So it's quite a quite a pleasure to have you speak to us this evening. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing your presentation. And I know you had some great videos. So you had a little preview before we uh, joined tonight. So hopefully all those videos work well. Let's see. All right. Well, thanks, Mark, and thanks, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here, and uh, I appreciate the support of Vantage and uh, Fuji um, International. I know some people are online, even though it's after midnight uh, in Germany. So hi, everyone, and uh, a real pleasure and a real pleasure to talk about, uh, you know, the Fuji system, uh, which we have at St. Mike's and has really been <clears throat> quite game changing for us. And I'm happy to talk about why that is. Um, my task today is to talk about cat eye, but, you know, I'm very passionate about the uh, Fuji Alexio uh, platform and how it has changed my ability to both uh, assess and remove lesion. So um, we are uh, we have a dedicated advanced uh, resection room at St. Mike's that is uh, totally stocked with uh, Fuji um, top to bottom. So very exciting uh, for us uh, and to partner with uh, both Vantage and Fuji. Um, so today we're going to talk about cat eye, uh, uh, something that I've been using now for over a year. So Mark, I, I actually have a question for you. Um, so you're about to have a colonoscopy your colonoscopist of choice took a last minute vacation because they knew they were scoping you, but uh, his or her junior colleague uh, is available. Um, they're in their second year of practice. They didn't do any fellowship training, but don't worry. Um, they, uh, they know all about biologic agents. Uh, and, uh, you know, do you want this procedure to be done with cat eye? A, yes, B, no, or C, I don't care. Well, fortunately, I, I don't have IVD, so I'm okay. So it doesn't matter for me that part. But uh, do on cat eye, uh, cat eye sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, and I think this, and I, I may make some people on the call a bit more angry than I want them to, but I think this this technology is more important, especially in, the, in early into practice. And for those who may not have had a full two years of endoscopy, uh, sorry, endoscopic training before they started doing colonoscopies in the general public, that's where I think this really fits. Okay, so sorry to put you on the spot, but you, you vote That's yes. Okay, um, I vote yes. Okay, good. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So this is the perspective from where I sit. Um, I get, and and I'm sure Rob is the same. Uh, we get referrals for Barrett's esophagus, and possibly 80% of early Barrett's neoplasia is missed by community endoscopists. We get referrals for advanced gastric cancer uh, because patients are either inadequately screened or have, you know, there's similar miss rates for early gastric cancer as there is for Barrett's esophagus. So we're just doing a really bad job finding upper GI lesions. Colonoscopy is supposed to be our bread and butter, um, but, you know, the problem is, is that people have a less than 100% sequel intubation rate, and there's various reasons for that. The ADR overall is just too low, um, and there's many, many reasons for that. Um, and if you were listening to what Rob said, he was, uh, you know, taught you an easier way to the cecum with the colo assist. And then when lesions are found, they're sent to the OR inappropriately when there's possible EMR, uh, EMRable. You're, people are resecting part of lesions. Uh, people think they're completely resecting lesions when they're not. And then there's lots of complications. And so there is a huge target for improvement here. And all of these things are leading to interval colon cancers. And we think that that consists of 10% of all colorectal cancer. And about 60%, um, we think, are from missed lesions at the time of colonoscopy. And there's two main drivers um, I see uh, that are that are uh, account for this. One is recognition failure. So people um, are passing the scope by these lesions and not seeing them. Maybe they're going too fast or they're just not seeing them or they're not exposing enough mucosa. So what's the answer? How can we do better? Do we need to teach residents better during residency? Do we need to have more CME events like this? Do we need skills improvement courses? And everyone can go uh, learn from Rob at the C course, and I teach that too. Do we need better, more um, uh, diverse and effective quality assurance programs? Well, this is what I thought the answer was, uh, which is why I did it, uh, a master's in quality improvement and patient safety. But you know, the more 
that I learn about artificial intelligence, I think that probably this is the answer to all of our problems. Um, my disclaimer is that I'm an advanced endoscopist. I'm a very like simple minded uh, guy. And so I, I, I am not a computer expert. I'm not uh, so and I don't design uh, AI uh, uh, systems. And so um, that's my disclaimer as I talk to you more about artificial intelligence. So what is AI? Well, AI is really just uh, computer systems and algorithms that can perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. You know, our phones do this already. Uh, I don't have a Tesla, but if I did, uh, um, it would probably be able to drive for me. And so these are all, this is all artificial intelligence doing that. There's some overlapping terminology here. Uh, and this slide I got from my mentor and friend, Tyler Burson, who is a true AI expert. Um, and, you know, AI we talked about uh, are just programming systems to perform tasks which require human intelligence. And, you know, but there's steps up from that. And, and what I'm going to tell you about today uh, is more deep learning. So machine learning is training algorithms to solve tasks by pattern recognition. Um, but we specifically have to program these. Um, deep learning is when the machine can actually develop training algorithms um, uh, based on deep neural networks, or we call them um, convoluted neural networks or CNNs with multiple layers in order to learn tasks. Um, so this is important to know. You know, why are we at an, an exciting juncture in AI? Well, well, I think that we're at this juncture because it seems like AI is starting to perform as good uh, as humans in very specific, in task specific things. And we'll sort of talk about what a few of those are uh, in endoscopy. And, and I think that's what makes it exciting. And based on this trajectory, um, you know, uh, soon enough, AI will be doing better uh, than novice endoscopists and for sure better than expert endoscopists. So where is AI in GI like right now? Well, we're gonna talk today about um, cat eye and its computer aided uh, uh, detection um, or computer assisted detection. We're gonna talk about computer assisted characterization um, and the future uh, holds you know, endoscopic quality indicators um, where um, you know, AI can do more than just uh, detect polyps and I'm sure I expect Fuji to be first at the table with some of these as well, uh, looking at how much of the mucosa and the colon uh, did you visualize. Uh, natural lingering processing and analytics, where uh, it'll be, sort of be able to integrate everything that you're doing and then precision medicine. So what can these CNN systems do? Well, I think real-time um, uh, computer-assisted detection or this CAD CAD E or CAD I um, is ex extremely important. It can flag lesions for you, uh, which lead to an increased ADR or adenoma detection rate and really increase um, uh, overall polyp detection rate. And we think that that's going to lead to a decrease in interval colon cancer. That's the goal, anyways. Um, and, and, you know, what it probably can do, although not doing quite yet, is show us when our uh, withdrawal technique is suboptimal. Are we drawing too fast? Is the colon not clean enough? Is our scope uh, slipping? And this is where cat eye comes in. And again, if you haven't got a Fuji scope into your hands yet, uh, I, I can't recommend this enough. I know Vantage and Fuji are, are on the call, but I tell this to people regardless of uh, of whether they're supporting a talk or not. Um, you know, it, it, it is just a different uh, uh, system. Um, so, you know, they have de both detection support sh through um, white light and LCI and characterization or BLI, um, uh, blue light imaging. And I know uh, in the next session, um, uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. And so how was the cat eye system developed? Well, it starts with data collection. And this data collection is extremely onerous and is really uh, one of the reasons why it's taken so long for this AI uh, to come to market. But, but experts have to um, uh, look at many hundreds of thousands of frames uh, of endoscopy, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of polyps and, and mark them uh, in order to um, help the system kind of come up with its algorithms for deep learning. And so all of these are uh, put into this system uh, really at the Fujifilm Creative AI Center, which helps uh, its system. So this is a true deep learning system. 
that is developing its own algorithms and fed into CADI. This can be updated um, as the system learns, um, and it's a software upgrade. So your CADI system um, that we have today is not going to be the same system that we have in six months and not going to be the same system uh, as in a year. Um, it is extremely easy to use and to integrate uh, with our system. Um, there's really just a, 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 a button on the scope that allows you to turn the cat eye on and off. And then once the cat eye is on, you can flip from detection mode, again, with white light uh, on the top right, LCI, uh, which I use for detection in the middle, and then BLI for characterization. Um, and then you just press one button on the processor to record uh, a video, and you can toggle this on the scope as well. Oops. Um, I lost my mouse. Uh, hold on one second. All right. So, you know, this is a video where, where uh, I routinely retroflex in the uh, um, in the Seacom, and you can see right away. Uh, and I don't know if you guys could hear that ding, but immediately, um, you know, the the system before I even saw that Paula picked it out. You get a you get a sound that dings, uh, and you get a box uh, around the lesion. So again, very user friendly. Shows you exactly where to look. Uh, and that picked it up well before, uh, you know, uh, I uh, picked it up. And so, uh, again, with your detection mode on, uh, using some sort of um, uh, uh, either the white light or um, uh, LCI, uh, you not only do you get a visual assist, but it sort of, you get this box around it and then a detection sound as well. So you can't miss it no matter how much you're trying to sleep on the job. Uh, it just can't be missed. Um, this is a video with the cat eye off. Uh, you can see, again, Mark would have picked this up, but I probably would have missed it. Uh, a very subtle lesion. And with the cat eye on, uh, here it's getting uh, picked up. So, again, um, you know, when I'm tired at the end of the day, if I'm distracted thinking about, uh, you know, the next case that I have, uh, this is going to pick up lesions no matter what. Cat eye never gets tired. Rob. Um, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's Mark. Uh, I didn't get to. Can you go back? The video actually didn't play. Oh, if you could do that for us again. Sorry to interrupt. None of them played. Uh, no, I didn't see either of those. Sorry. Oh, can you see it playing now? Not currently. Sorry, no. Okay. The still frame on my end as well. Huh. Worked yesterday. Let's see. How about this one? Are you guys seeing this? Not currently. Okay. Um, oh, let me stop sharing for one second. Let's try that again. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. While we're waiting, I will say that uh, you mentioned artificial intelligence with Tesla. Uh, I have an Audi e-tron, so my uh, artificial intelligence is much better than that Tesla stuff. I'm sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Mark, tell me, are you seeing the video now? Very good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank goodness. So this is the first video that I showed. Um, and uh, again, we'll skip to the one where we play them side by side. So this is your uh, cat eye off. Uh, again, subtle lesion that uh, you could easily miss. Uh, and then on the right, you're gonna see uh, the, really the same lesion with the cat eye on. Uh, again, it's, it picks it up right away before you probably would even see it, uh, flags it for you, dings for you, and so you're not missing that uh, uh, lesion. 
<clears throat> this is a case of mine uh, from Friday. Uh, again, withdrawing. You can see I'm in LCI mode, which I use for all my withdrawal. And then uh, the the uh, you can see right here as as it picked it up right away. Again, before I even saw that, I could have driven right by, uh, but but the cat eye picked that up. And again, I flipped right to characterization mode uh, right away. Uh, so I can uh, kind of tell what that lesion is. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, and I'm then examining that lesion, deciding what I think the uh, histology is, deciding on my resection technique, uh, and I'm off to the races. So this is a beautiful demonstration um, of the uh, Fuji zoom colonoscope. Again, uh, I can tell right away that that's a, a sesalcerated polyp, uh, and I'm removing it uh, using cold snare. Um, uh, again, I flip out, I turn back to BLI to see that there is some fault uh, um, still there. And uh, again, not a perfect uh, resection, but I'm taking off a second piece. So I know that there's nothing left uh, that time. So again, combination um, uh, of <clears throat> detection. Here's another lesion, which again, uh, the cat eye picks up right away. I'm off to characterization mode. Uh, I know that that's a sessile uh, serrated polyp, uh, and I'm taking it off. Uh, we're going to come back to this uh, one time permitting. Um, so what about characterization mode? So this is the CAD-X uh, computer-assisted characterization, uh, and it splits it up into a binary uh, distinction. Is it hyperplastic? And now hyperplastic polyps uh, show up in green versus neoplastic in yellow. Uh, again, right now, hyperplastic polyps and uh, sesalcerated polyps are included in that. So it's important to know where you are in the colon and what your pretest probability is for having a sesalcerated adenoma or sesalcerated polyp. And then neoplastic are both adenoma and cancers included in that. Now, I expect that this is going to uh, change, but right now, uh, I, I still find it amazing uh, that the system can look at a polyp and tell you the underlying uh, pathology. Mark, stop me if things aren't showing up. Uh, so this is, again, a small little polyp. Uh, and we're in BLI, which is our uh, characterization mode. And, and you can see it, um, the system is tracking the polyp over here and giving you both the word of what I think it is and, and then showing you in color. Uh, and this is the same concept for another teeny tiny polyp. So these, even these diminutive polyps, it's able to uh, give you a, a, an answer in uh, real time. This is a slightly bigger lesion, which I showed Mark yesterday. Uh, very interesting uh, pathology here. And I knew right away that this was unbelievable for our uh, characterization mode. And so I'm examining the lesion. I'm using near focus uh, and I'm using the zoom capacity of this scope, which is really unbelievable to look at both the pit pattern and the vascular pattern. So I'm getting an up close and personal uh, look at this lesion. And interestingly, this is a mixed type lesion. So it's a combination of sesalcerated polyp and adenoma, quite rare. At first, when I looked at it, I thought it was going to be uh, an SSP with dysplasia, but it's actually a mixed lesion. And the, the cat eye is actually telling you that there's areas that are uh, sesalcerated uh, polyp and there are areas that came back as neoplastic adenoma. And the pathology actually confirmed that. Uh, it was quite unbelievable. So um, the cat eye told me about this before uh, I knew it and definitely before the pathologist told us. So what's the data? Um, well, um, this is uh, one of the biggest studies done with cat eye, seven centers in Europe and Japan. Uh, you can see some of the big players in the artificial intelligence uh, realm. They looked at over 250,000 frames, over 800, 1800 polyps. They demarcated all of them manually, and they called this the ground truth uh, for computer-assisted detection. Um, and they use pathology, obviously, for uh, computer-aided uh, characterization. Uh, and they allowed their system, uh, the cat eye in this case, to undergo deep learning. And they looked at both performance and performance versus endoscopists. And um, they concluded here that, that the deep learning was actually equivalent to experts. So you take an expert advanced endoscopist like Alessandro Rupici, one of the world's best, and it actually has similar sensitivity for detection and similar accuracy for characterization. And it, in fact, it took a non-expert colonoscopist, someone who's done less than 100 colonoscopy, you added um, computer-aided detection, and their detection rate was similar to experts. So I find that kind of 
you know, mind blowing. We talk about how to get low detectors uh, up to the mean. Um, and it seems to me like the signal here is that uh, um, artificial intelligence is going to be the answer. And in terms of detection too, your optical diagnosis is so important to determine your resection strategy and to, you know, possibly for a resect and discard approach moving forward. Um, and, you know, excellent sensitivity and specificity uh, on the detection side and pretty good on the characterization side too, over 80% um, are across the board. So there has been a, a meta-analysis uh, looking at five randomized trials. This was done by uh, Cesar Hassan, and I was actually on a panel with him uh, last week talking about artificial intelligence um, uh, and its uptake into uh, endoscopy. They compared um, uh, computer-assisted detection versus standard uh, colonoscopy, and their key finding was that the ADR was higher in the uh, artificial intelligence group. Again, no surprise, we expected it to be this way, um, but, but um, you know, they're actually showing this um, in over 4,000 patients. And so, um, you know, because we think that ADR is attached to decreased interval cancers, you know, this is an important and, and clinically significant finding. And this was consistent across all polyp sizes and colon locations. So the initial thought that was that the cat eye was going to be better at detecting smaller polyps that maybe we were going to miss. Um, but the benefit was actually across the colon, uh, which I found quite interesting. And so then, you know, you talk about this, this um, uh, balance between increasing ADR, which is truly increasing the quality of your examinations, reducing your operator variability. So no one has to be worried that Mark is going to um, have a colonoscopy by someone who's only done 40 colonoscopies before because they're using artificial intelligence and their detection rate is going to be excellent. Now, is this going to lead to increased poly unnecessary polypectomies? Maybe. Is there an implementation cost? Well, you heard about you know, potentially some cost uh, upfront. And is this going to increase surveilling colonoscopies? Well, in Ontario, where we're putting people back into the FIT program, uh, maybe not. But these are all things that we're going to have to weigh uh, as we move forward. So, you know, what is your future going to look like? Well, you know, this is our present at, at St. Mike's. We find a lesion, and this was a lesion that actually wasn't detected. I was sent actually a much bigger lesion. And when I was looking around for that one, I found this one. Um, you know, this is a lesion, uh, again, in the right colon. And so I'm using cat eye uh, to help me detect where these lesions are. I'm using the characterization mode to really interrogate these lesions and help me decide uh, what this lesion is. Because if this is a cess ulcerated uh, polyp, I'm taking this off cold. If this is an adenoma, I'm probably doing it hot. Uh, again, a more subtle lesion uh, here, which, which I found on withdrawal in a patient, again, with another lesion. And uh, again, I'm letting the characterization mode because I know and I trust it uh, is going to help me determine uh, my resection strategy. And so this one uh, I took off uh, cold, which I don't think we have time to watch here. Um, and so that's what it looks like uh, after resection. So, you know, I, I think, you know, all of our futures are going to have artificial intelligence uh, in our on our scope tower and it's going to help us flag lesions going to tell us when our technique is suboptimal and it's going to decrease our interval cancer uh, rate. And, you know, it's going to do even more than that. It's going to complete our reports. It's going to record our quality metrics and it's going to continuously learn and help us improve uh, the way we take care of patients, turning what can be a very convoluted navigation through our day into something that's uh, uh, pretty simple. So uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, it really is a, pre a pleasure partnering with uh, Vantage and Fuji. And uh, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. That's great, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, I don't have anything to the chat just yet. Uh, I will comment to my last colonoscopy. And yes, I would have preferred to have AI assist because my colleague did my colonoscopy. And who knows what he missed? He's been, he's been practicing just one year less than me, so I'm sure he's pretty good. Um, a couple questions for you, maybe some comments. So, um, for CRC screening programs, I yep. see this as a as a huge add-on. This should be done for CSC programs, in my opinion. Um, just watching these videos are amazing. I mean, yes, you said you all. I'm sure Mark would have missed this, and yeah, maybe I would have. But with the AI, I probably it would have flagged me and and digged me to say this needs to be done looked at. So I think that's an amazing comment, and I think we should probably be advocating for CRC programs 
across the country be using this this AI assist program. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a no-brainer, um, especially for for fit lists uh, um, uh, that we're doing where we know there's going to be lesions there. Uh, I think this is a, you know, this is going to be a must-have. And I think in five years, we're not even going to think about it. We're just going to toggle it, and it's going to be just a normal part of uh, everyone's unit. It seems, you know, so crazy now that we're using AI, but but I think, you know, just like high-definition endoscopy, it's just going to be stable standard of care. So uh, I, and, you know, colon screening, pro, obviously when I'm, you know, going in to do ESD on a pulp in the rectum, not helpful, but, you know, for these high volume centers that need to become more efficient, um, uh, it's going to be outstanding. Um, I'm going to answer one question, I guess, Mark, while you're uh, yep. uh, uh, from the audience is, what do you do with poor prep cat eye bings like crazy? Um, yeah, for sure an issue. Uh, I agree that is a limitation of the artificial intelligence is you need good preps. Um, but, you know, I guess for me, uh, it's, you know, I turn it off, I wash that segment of colon, and then I uh, turn it back on as I examine the colon again. So uh, I think it's just the ease of the way it, it integrates with the system, um, uh, I think makes it easy to do it on and off. Again, I will admit that I have not used any of the other uh, um, uh, systems that are, you know, being used in some other places in the world. So I don't know how they integrate quite as well. Uh, but I, what I can say is that cat eye is quite seamless. So the on off, uh, you know, if it's bothering you because of false positives, uh, then you just turn it off, clean the colon and you're on your way. Your thought on cat eye versus doing chromo. What do you think? Um, in yeah, IBD so, specifically, sorry, IBD specifically. Uh, oh, okay, IBD. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I don't know the data, and I'm sure it's coming at uh, evaluating for IBD-related dysplasia. So if you're just if you're doing regular colon cancer um, surveillance in a patient, that's different. If you're looking for polyps where you know, like your run-of-the-mill tubular adenomas or self-serrated polyps, that's different. But if you're looking for IBD-related dysplasia, uh, I believe that this is also going to work for that. Uh, the deep learning just has to occur. So I think we need data to show that it is useful for this. Um, I am personally not doing any dye-based chromo endoscopy for my IBD patients. I'm doing all, I actually bring them only into the Fuji room. Um, sorry, another Fuji plug, and I use LCI uh, for withdrawal because I believe based on the, the data that we're going to talk about next time, that the data supports LCI for uh, dysplasia detection. And so I withdraw only with LCI and then characterize with BLI. So I think this is a strength of Fuji um, that uh, Olympus does not have uh, yet. And so um, I think AI will only help with that. So it'll flag areas of possible dysplasia that I'm missing even with LCI. That was a shameless plug from the presentation in two weeks that I'm presenting. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> I'll be there. Right, very good. Uh, another question about the chat regarding blood. Uh, does blood cause confusion to AI in recognizing benign versus malignant lesions in your opinion, your experience? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, usually a little bit of ooze I have found uh, doesn't do that. So sometimes when you wash a lesion, especially malignant lesions, they're going to ooze. Um, and that's just one you know feature that concerns us when we are evaluating a lesion. Uh, and so uh, it hasn't been an issue uh, for me. Uh, again, I've been using it, I guess, for over a year now. Obviously, if something is pouring out blood, uh, then that is not going to be useful. So you saw when I was taking off the polyp, uh, I turned the cat eye off because I don't want it to go crazy. So once you're out of the detection and characterize the need for detection and characterization, I do turn it off uh, because of the sounds that it, that it will make. So I guess, you know, a field full of blood probably would cause it some confusion. Great. Thank you. Um, in respect of race time, it is now 8.03. We did sort of a bit late, but we have three minutes left for the one-hour timeline. Uh, so I want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Moscow and Dr. Berger. Um, I really learned a lot uh, from your presentations. Um, much appreciated. Uh, there will be a evaluation form sent out to participants from tonight in the next probably two to three days just for your evaluation purposes to uh, give us some feedback. And again, as already said by Jeff and, and Rob, sorry, Robert, 
I want to say thank you to Vantage and Fuji for uh, allowing us to have this time together. Um, and oh, one more just came through. Sorry. Before we go, uh, do current Fuji scopes we have in New Brunswick have this software update? Uh, that's some one of our colleagues here, uh, Dr. Bergerens in uh, in New Brunswick. And no, not yet, but uh, if all goes well, damn it, we will. Hopefully, uh, moving forward. So, not yet, but let's see what happens in the future. There's so, a second thank you. There to, uh, just uh, just in terms of our next uh, session, um, oh, there was yeah. a question regarding using LCI oh, yeah. and BI for Barrett's and gastric. <laughs> I'm sure this is going to get touched on next week, yes. and, and I think those of us who do a lot of Barrett's, um, this has completely revolutionized how we inspect segments of Barrett's esophagus. So uh, for the person who asked that question, I think we're going to get into detail about that at the next uh, yep. the next webinar. Yes, yeah, I, believe Dr. So, I believe Dr. Bookman will be approaching that, that topic uh, in about two weeks. So there you go. You can see that registration there for December 15th. 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So those of you who are, have not registered yet, please do so, and we'll see everybody in about two weeks. Any more comments from Dr. Moscow or Dr. Berger? No, that that was great, Rob. Great talk, and uh, Mark, great job. That was that was really fun. Yeah, likewise. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody in a couple of weeks to kind of expand on this a bit further. All right. Sure. Have a good evening, everybody, and uh, we'll talk soon. Please watch out for that evaluation and uh, complete that to give us some feedback so we can improve the presentation in two weeks' time if necessary. Thank you so much. Awesome. Take care.